Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Doctor Who Guide, a community where it's all about helping each other grow your knowledge collection and connection with other Doctor Who fans. I'm your host, Alex Patterson, and today I am so excited. We have a very, very special guest, Lee Sullivan. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, it's my great pleasure, and I'm glad that you're excited. <laughs> I don't have that effect on everybody. You would certainly have that effect on me. I have loved the Doctor Who comics for, for years now, and of course, reading the latest in Doctor Who magazine, Liberation of the Daleks. I mean, your artwork in that, being the first to draw comics for the 14th Doctor, I mean, that's absolutely incredible. And of course, you know, we'll get into that later, but we are talking today because our connection, which I can't believe I'm saying this, our connection is the Terraquis Distributors Unofficial 1997 Annual. I was lucky enough to have a short story in there. This annual is, of course, based all around and features the companions of Stacy and Sard, who you helped to co-create and, of course, drew their initial comic run in the Radio Times comics. I mean, there was something like 42 issues of these, was it six panel comic strips? Roughly speaking, uh, ranging from four to seven, I think. So you've got, you know, an article in the annual that our friend Anthony uh, did with you. If you could just for anybody who doesn't maybe know, tell us about how it was, you know, creating these new new companions and how you got involved with Gary Russell. OK, well, I suppose the thing is you have to frame this in, in saying that what this appeared in was a listing, basically a listings magazine that was put out by the BBC uh, back in 1996, 97. Um, and it was to celebrate the TV movie Doctor Who. The plan was that um, they were going to produce, I think, a year's worth of of strips, so one a week. Each one would be four, five, six, seven panels, uh, and then telling a, a series of continuing stories. Um, and Gary was approached to write it um, by the editors of Radio Times magazine. It had a really big um, uh, readership in those days, not so much now, but because everything is diversified so much. But in back in those days, I think in England and what, um, the United Kingdom, I should say, it was probably doing maybe four or five million copies a week. So uh, it had a very wide audience. Uh, so to be invited to work on it uh, was very special for me, not least because I, was, I had in my mind uh, the illustrations that Frank Bellamy uh, had produced for the John Pertwee and Tom Baker eras. He'd had covers and interior comic strips, partial comic strips then. So I was very, very honoured to be uh, following in his uh, shoes um, because he was an enormously influential artist in the 1960s and 70s uh, before his sad, sadly early death. Gary, I think, was approached because he'd written the novelization for the TV movie. Gary very kindly suggested that I might be the artist for the job. Um, because we got on well and we'd been uh, to, over the years, at various conventions together, although we hadn't actually directly worked with each other, we had a good working knowledge of each other's reputation, and, uh, and he was a very nice chap anyway. I got the call, I think, from Radio Times, and I said yes. It was very, very easy. And then it was done in quite a rush because I think the, we probably had about three weeks, four weeks maybe lead-in time. Um, and that was in advance of the TV movie actually being shown here because I think the TV movie was shown on the weekend and then the following weeks Radio Times featured the first episode. We really got our skates on to do that. The brief I had really from Gary, Gary's a terribly generous uh, collaborator because he really lets you get on with anything the way you want to do it. He, he, I think he figures that if you've got someone because you like their work, then let them do their work, you know. Um, and so the characters that he came up with, I knew he was fond of Ice Warriors, so it was inevitable that Saad would appear. Um, I, I, I suppose I should have made, in retrospect, I should have made Saad a little more, a less generic Ice Warrior, uh, perhaps. But actually, as it turned out, it didn't really matter because I got to draw lots of other different types of Ice Warriors. And then I actually got to draw uh, the uh, one of the, uh, the female Ice Warriors, and that was good fun because she didn't have a helmet on. So I kind of speculated what they might look like. I think Jurassic Park was not long gone by then, so... Um, 
everybody had the idea of, of kind of dinosaurs being a little more kind of flashy than before. So I thought I'd do that, but I, I, I made the mistake, well, mistake. I didn't think about it because it was a female. I kind of gave her a female form. And then people later on informed me that possibly reptiles don't have uh, mammary glands. <laughs> so <laughs> I just done the usual comic thing of giving her a figure hugging uh, uni uh, um, uniform <laughs> or robes. Oh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, but designing them, I mean, I just used an ice for generic ice for facade. And Stacey, I base, I think, it is believed, and I must believe it because I probably said it at the time, that uh, it was based on um, Denise Richards, who was in Starship Troopers. I don't think she ended up looking like her, but in the in the rough, certainly the rough that I supplied, which I probably never looked at again, that's who I kind of loosely based it on. I don't, I, I don't see any resemblance now, but I'm told that's what I said at the time. So it must be right. Must it? <laughs> I mean that's that's incredible the the creation of two two new companions and then now kind of mirrored you know coming in at the start of the 14th doctor and liberation of the daleks uh what was that like finding out that you get to draw four and be a part of the very first story that the 14th doctor would have after the power of the doctor cliffhanger well, it was uh, extremely gratifying. I hadn't actually appeared in Doctor Who magazine, for, I think, for 20 years before. It was kind of my 20th anniversary away, although I'd done lots of other Doctor Who work in the meantime. For one reason or other, I hadn't actually appeared in the magazine uh, doing strips. Um, and uh, so that was very nice to be asked back. Uh, nice to be asked, particularly by Marcus Hearn, who was uh, who's now the editor, because he and I have had a, a relationship, working relationship more in the area of Jerry Anderson uh, reprints. I'd done some drawings for him. But now he was editor of Doctor Who magazine. He gave me another shot at, at this. And I think the, the way it came about was because Marcus had said to me on a, several occasions he'd like me to draw for the magazine again. And as the story was going to be a fairly, um, a, well, fairly high-profile one, it had to be done... A, it was going to feature the Daleks. And I think that that was my selling point uh, because I'd drawn Daleks back in the day. Um, I think the second Doctor Who comic strip I drew was um, Nemesis of the Daleks, which was very popular at the time. And then Emperor of the Daleks and Daleks and Daleks and Daleks uh, ad infinitum. Uh, and uh, there you go. <laughs> With another one of my creations on the front there, uh, Benny Summerfield. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, I think because of the Daleks, there were there were probably other artists in the offing, um, but because I was kind of known as Mr. Dalek, uh, I probably got the job because of that. And um, I had drawn the forty, uh, the tenth Doctor, for a thing called Battles in Time magazine over here. That was a very much more junior kind of comic strip. So it was nice to get a chance to do something a little more like the earlier stuff that I'd done, which was for uh, ostensibly a a an older audience. <laughs> I don't know whoever grows up watching Doctor Who. I haven't met them yet, but um, uh, so yeah, it was it was really nice to be asked, but particularly because. Russell D. Davis had made the choice about me doing the work. Um, if it's Daleks, then there's only one man for the job. <laughs> it's just, that's a brilliant like that. I, on my gravestone, that's going to be there. And that was that was really nice. And in particular, because it's supposed to be a canonical first story for the 14th Doctor. I don't know if they'll actually refer to that at all. I have no idea. I would probably suspect that they won't mention the enormous Dalek war that he's just been through, but maybe they will. I, I would, I would love to be surprised in that direction. But in, th but as far as it goes, Russell T. Davis uh, and the script editor are uh, um, look uh, are looking over all the scripts very carefully. They're vetting them so that nothing is in contradiction with the stuff that they're doing. So it's it's as good as canonical can be, really, as far as comic strip. And that's the first time that's ever happened 
Um, I've worked on a series before Rivers of London with Ben Aronovich and Andrew Cartmel, uh, and that those comics were canon in that universe. Um, but it's it, it's very rare that you get, and particularly the TV series, the comics are never canon because they're always something that's separate to one side of the TV show. They're a small kind of affair. But this being a big gap between the regeneration and the first story. I think it was a lovely kind of thing. And, and I think Russell T. Davis uh, made a present of the 14th Doctor to Doctor Who magazine and me. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're the only ones that get to do him for this year. And um, so it's a very special, very uh, responsible position. It was, it was gratifying and terrifying by equal measure, really. Also, because I was returning after 20 years, and who knows, I might, I might have been rubbish. <laughs> well, I, I loved your, your intro in the, it was uh, Doctor Magazine issue 584, where very first issue of Liberation of the Daleks is, and uh, there's a, this issue's contributors include section that introduced you, and you said uh, in your quote, the artist grumbled under his breath, I won't do it, whatever it is, I refuse. The editor uttered the word that would strike terror into the soul of any artist. Tell me more. I mean, <laughs> just incredible, what an incredible introduction back into the show. I went as far as I could to duplicate Tom Baker's um, uh, uh, in, um, in uh, Genesis of the Daleks uh, being called back by the uh, Time Lords. So if, if, if anyone had missed that reference, that's what it was about, really. <laughs> incredible i love that reading you know dark two comics over the years i've seen the name sullivan on the bindings of you know these graphic novel publications we had a recent publication for the dalek chronicles there was a lovely preface that talked about the unique use of either reflections or really creative use of the comic panels and the shapes that they would take so there's one particular shot of uh, you know a dalek seeing something and there's a reflection in the eye of the dalek and so the actual image that you're supposed to be looking at represented there how do you see your art style adopting abnormal panel lines and it's not something that i think a lot of us notice consciously or think about when you know, you think about the art that's housed in the frame, but the frame itself can become art and helps to indicate, I think, pacing, pauses, but also can become part of the art itself. So what do you think about that? Because I've noticed in some of your panels, even uh, in the, the reflection of the Tenth Doctor's eyes, you see Daleks. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, uh, you're completely right. The the 1960s comic strips were fabulous and they were I, I, it might be difficult for younger people to appreciate the impact that those things had. I read those when I was 10, no, yeah, about, about 10, I guess, maybe eight. But that's 1965, isn't it? Something like that. So um, 65, 66. So I would, been, I would have been eight then. Uh, I had never, oh, well, the, there was a there were two things there were Dalek annuals which came out around the same time same artist Richard Jennings those and TV Twenty One which was a weekly sort of newspaper kind of style comic with lots of really good color pages uh, spectacularly good artwork by very good artists based around the Jerry Anderson uh, universe of Stingray Thunderbirds Fireball XL Five uh, and the Daleks got a feature in the back and they were the Dalek annual and the Dalek comic strip were just about the Daleks. The Daleks were the heroes of the strip. I mean, they still yes. did a bit of exterminating on the side, but, you know, uh, but they were, it was from their point of view, which is extremely interesting. And also written by David Whittaker, who was the script editor of the original Hartnell um, uh, series uh under terry nation's name but uh but it was so it was as good as it could get and it, it was in color and i mean there was nothing was in color to do with doctor who at that point there were no uh, there was one black and white comic strip in tv comic um which was a very sort of junior level uh, comic strip good but you know a junior level but the the dalek strip was fantastically advanced they developed the whole idea of things like the Scaro City being having magnetized sand around it so that it could draw it all in on itself to protect itself if it was under attack. And the Dalek flying saucers were generated there 
the little hoverbouts that the Daleks fly about on, which I've reintroduced with great <laughs> great happiness into the uh, Liberation Strip. Um, they were all formed at that very early stage in, in 1964-65 um, in those comic strips. And, you know, they, were, they, they just opened my mind up. To get to your point, uh, the page layouts in those times were not done in the sort of Marvel way of page layouts. There's, there was a, there became a very standard Marvel way of doing things in the, in America in the 1960s, uh, which was very clear storytelling uh, and not playing around with those kind of um, image shapes uh, for good reason. That that it, it made it easy for people to read. They could see what's happening much more clearly. British comics were much more into uh, dynamics, I think. Um, and Frank Bellamy was was one of the artists in TV21 drawing Thunderbirds. And you you couldn't get more dynamic in terms of his page layouts than, than him. So all of that informed me when I was a kid. And so when I came to drawing comic strips myself for Doctor Who, it was just the grammar of doing it for me um, that you would see through a Dalek's eye and see the the gun sights and um, maybe make that a round panel, which I think I've I think I've done again recently. Um, and uh, to have arms stretching out of the frame, uh, guns stretching out of the frame, uh, eyepiece kind of stretching out of the frame, the Doctor sometimes popping out of the frame, uh, sometimes knocking out the background altogether. Uh, it's a way of it is a way of telling the story. Sometimes not very much is happening in a story. Not meant, not much in the way of of action is taking place, and you still have to keep it kind of lively, as as much as the battle sequences. The battle sequences kind of take care of themselves because there's stuff hacking around the page, and uh, and you don't really need to worry about that. But it's quite nice to have visually interesting solutions to, diff to to what is quite an ordinary, nearly always, comics are about fights punctuated by long, uh, longers where people just simply talk to each other. And that's the bit that you have to try and make interesting because the battles are obviously interesting. <laughs> so really? that's, that was it, it was harking straight back to those 1960s uh, things. Well, I, I love that. And I find that it's it's very interesting when um, I believe I was I was just reading um, Peter Haining's The Doctor Who File. And uh, there was a section where they were talking about writing a Doctor Who episode as being a W, where you start off at the height of the action, you go down, and then there's a there's, you know, a little bit of period of downtime. And then there's more and then down again and up again uh, for the finale at the end. Do you find that that's the same with a comic or is it like, you know, issue, you know, the first part is at the top of the W and then the next issue is not, or do you, you always have to get it back to a cliffhanger. So I suppose it's, it's either a V yeah. or a W. <laughs> no, I think that the, the, the W I've always, I mean, I don't think about it consciously and that's mostly in the script. Uh, so it's much more a writer's thing to try and do that. Um, but certainly uh, I think that all, all, all stories really are told in that kind of general fashion because you, um, if they are action, adventure, comics or, or stories, films or anything, they've got to be, you've got to start with an impact. Then you've got to explain what you're, what's really the setup. Then you have some interesting drama. Then you, everybody sits back and says, well, I don't know what just happened there. And they talk about that, and then they resolve the thing at the end, and that's nearly always the climax. So, uh, yeah, the cliffhanger thing is uh, with, with the Radio Times thing that actually was oh, that was that was a beast of a thing to do because in each week we had to do in six panels we had to have a recap for where we were, the introduction of what was happening now, and the resolution of what was happening now plus a cliffhanger. Uh, and that was all squeezed into six panels, generally speaking. And that was, I always felt that Gary's task was a very hard one. And uh, mm -hmm. my task was simply to try and uh, have enough space left to, um, to tell the story visually, because Gary, being an art, a writer, uh, and we had a very small area. I will, I will try and demonstrate the size of, it's probably something like that. 
um, the, the size of the comic strip. Because it was on a half a page, you couldn't actually have smaller word balloons than normal because people couldn't read them. <laughs> so we had to have the word balloons about the same size. And consequently, the pictures had to be a bit smaller. So I designed the whole page. Each one of those pages I designed around the word balloons. And that I would, I would sit and on a computer assemble some speech balloons and some text of what Gary had written. And then for the first few weeks, because we were getting used to it, and, and that hadn't been a problem in the past, but it was when we had this lack of space, there was actually very, very little space for anything going on. It got so much dialogue in there. So I, I very, very cheekily said, look, Gary, I've got to cut half of this dialogue. Are you, do you mind? And he was completely fine about it. He was very professional and, and understood why. Uh, and then we got into a rhythm where he did much more sparse text stuff. So um, we got onto that. Okay. But anyway, the lettering is lettering and design of the pages is always really, really important. And it's the thing I do first. I always include uh, where the speech balloon is going to go, because it informs if you know person A is speaking, then person B, then person C, then person A, you have to, all in one panel, you have to make sure that there'll be word balloons which can make logical sense going left to right, top to bottom. And so you, it basically, you're then choreographing, that's how I think of it, choreographing the characters within the, within the frame. Uh, and sometimes if you, it helps if you have a slightly angular extra bit of a panel um, because then you can slot another word balloon into that corner piece. And, uh, you know, so that process of actually designing the pages is the naughtiest part of a comic to me. I have no idea how we arrived at this particular juncture, but uh, there it is. <laughs> I That's <rest> amazing. My... <laughs> That's incredible. I mean... I love that. My only claim to fame with Daleks is that I have made one out of cake, uh, a cake and candy. And so I, uh, I, there it is. Oh, well, that's very good. It <laughs> you was... sold, the, uh, sold the sink plunger uh, item, uh, uh, very well there. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's all made out of candy. It was uh, something like 11 pounds, um, almost a foot tall. Uh, I really, <laughs> It was, I mean, that's it compared to me. And uh, we, we <laughs> needed the help of um, of our neighbors to, to finish it. it. It it would exterminate you if you had the whole thing, I think. <laughs> My attempt to create one out of candy taught me a lot about, you know, what can we engineer for a Dalek? What does it look like? The different parts. I, You know, some people who have built a Dalek, I'm sure many fans can attest to it or who have played with the action figures, the just the detail. For you, what has been the hardest part of drawing a Dalek all of these years? And, and what's been easy? Has, do people confuse what, what might be the easiest part and what might be the hardest? What for you is the hardest thing about drawing a Dalek? Uh, well, it, uh, my approach to drawing the Daleks was always to try and make them as look as much like the props as possible, depending on what type I was drawing. Um, I recently had to draw the Imperials again for the Liberation. Uh, and I made the stupid mistake of, um, of thinking, oh, I'll just redesign the hoverbouts to reflect the octagonal and uh, hexagonal shapes of the, of, the, of the Dalek mothership from um, Remembrance of the Daleks. Uh, I really wished I hadn't started that because it was a nightmare. <laughs> they were far harder to draw than the Daleks were. But, that, but the Daleks, to me, because I come from a technical and wildlife jointly uh, um, uh, education background in, in illustration terms, I've always been able to understand the shape of the Dalek and how the relative shapes relate to each other. And I really enjoy that about them. I love the fact that they're, uh, they have particular, they start off as a cylinder at the top and as a dome, but as a cylinder, and they carry on down the neck as a cylinder, and then they start to transform into what ultimately is the, the uh, irregular uh, polygon shape of the base. And I, I love that transition. I like the fact that there are hemispheres all over them. I've always kind of made a joke that they have 56 balls which is probably why they're so antagonistic towards everybody and in, in such a bad temper, all that testosterone. Uh, and, um, uh, but 
actually the hemispheres are the thing that are hardest to draw because each one of them has a very slightly different angle, uh, particularly if you're drawing them from a, in a perspective shot. And so there they might kind of curse. The bête noir for me is, is drawing the, the hemispheres to make them look as if they're... Because they're... Um, technically, they are a flat disc on a surface with a dome around it. And then changing the angle on that means that you change the angle of the disc area that they sit on. And then they then you have to have the dome coming out from them. So they're, they're a little tricky, although I use lots of... Um, cheating techniques now because I draw digitally these days. When I started off, I drew everything in the standard old fashioned way. But now I use uh, a thing called Manga Studio, which I think is called Clip Studio, something like that these days. Um, and a large uh, Wacom uh, tablet um, uh, mm. thing to draw on. So um, actually what that makes the hemispheres much more easy because I can generally draw one at the specified angle and then I can copy it, move it down. But it still takes ages. They just take time. Daleks take time because they are just full of ellipses and full of, um, you know, kind of awkward things and remembering which way around the gun goes and, you know, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> sometimes I feel, sometimes I flip a drawing and I think, oh yeah, that's good enough. No, 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 I've got to draw the the arms separately so I can move those about. <laughs> yeah, how different I, they would I, have I, been. I how different they would have been if the original. I think some of the original designs had the gun and the plunger on different levels. Yeah, um, that, that didn't happen. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it didn't look quite as good. But, you know, if you do see a side profile, most of the time you will see, you know, one or the other that. raised or lowered. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. I, I think oh, my dad um, was a carpenter and, and a model maker, and he um, he made me my first Dalek out of a Kellogg's cornflake packet, the cardboard. Uh, so if you looked inside it, you could actually see Kellogg's. Um, and, uh, and a balsa wood top, which he'd fashioned. But he hadn't grasped that it was actually cylindrical, the top. He made it a sort of, um, in, in looking down at it, as an ellipse, so that the it was kind of like a squash, darling. Um, uh, and, I, and he'd just drawn the grill at the front, I think. And I was really thrilled with it. But all the time I was thinking, yeah, Dad, but that's not right. <laughs> And I think I think that attitude and and looking at all the toys that came out in the 1960s, none of which really were, were very like a Dalek, um, that that made me super critical of uh, other people's versions of Daleks and made me the most pernickety person and ideal to for drawing Daleks to make them look like Daleks. That's my goal. I mean, the, the guys in the 60s, there was a guy called Ron Turner, who drew magnificently weird Daleks. And they were a bit more like the movie Daleks, but they were, sometimes he'd put three rows of balls, sometimes there'd be four or five or whatever suited him. But he didn't let the design get in the way of his uh, uh, interpretation of them. And I admire that tremendously, but I couldn't do it for Toffees, really. I have, they have to look like Daleks to me or, or I've failed. You know? <laughs> I appreciate that that level of uh, that attention to detail, and actually looking looking back at uh, you know seeing the iterations of the Dalek designs and how certain episodes like the Daleks or the Dalek Invasion of Earth might might be our, our personal favorites. But the Daleks, you know, a lot of important design elements went into them by that point, but they they didn't have the midsection ribbing, or they would have the the you know solar dishes on the back, and oh, I love you know. Yeah. And and the bases had to be bigger to cover the the larger wheels because they were on location and and so it, it is fun to to you know see that detail and and uh, I appreciate all that you put into it. Um, thank you so much for for your time today for sharing your your thoughts. It's uh, you know gone by so quickly and and I appreciate it so much. Um, and I am so excited to be able to have written four characters that you co-created and uh, you know I really hope that you enjoy the annual and uh, it'll be out by the time this video comes out. so anybody who's watching um, 
please do get it. It's going to be absolutely incredible. I've I've only I've seen some parts of it, not all of it, so I'm I'm excited. Me too. I'm looking forward to seeing it very much, and I look forward to seeing your contribution. Uh, and I'm also looking forward um, uh, because I'm I'm looking forward to sticking this little guy on top of my uh, robot mower and uh, and having him trundling about on his uh, on his on his way around the garden. Uh, I'll do a little impersonation. Forward for total Dalek victory. So there you are. Amazing. That's, uh, I don't. Do you think I've spent too much time with Daleks? <laughs> that it's is possible. incredible. No ring <laughs> modulator, nothing. Just able ah, to do that. Old school. <incredible, incredible. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an My absolute pleasure. pleasure.